welcome everybody. My sincere thanks to all of you for joining us here this evening. My name is Jan Plug, and I'm the acting, I always put a lot of emphasis on the word acting. I'm the acting <laughs> dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and particularly proud to be that today. Uh, we're really delighted to welcome everybody, uh, both in person and online, for the annual Hani and Najet Hassan lecture. It's really wonderful to see so many people here and especially so many people from the community. And I also want to welcome the people who are joining us uh, virtually. I'd like to begin by um, acknowledging that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lunapewak, and the Chinonkton nations on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be, home, to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors mm -hmm. of our society. Providing a land acknowledgement is one way that we show respect and honor the Indigenous peoples of the land on which we work and live. It's an acknowledgement of the contributions, many of them erased over the years, that Indigenous communities have made. It's in a similar spirit that we gather here today in mid-October during Canadian Islamic Heritage Month. And thanks to the generosity of the Hassan family, whose donation to Western makes this possible, the lecture affords the possibility or the opportunity to celebrate our faculty's commitments to anti-racism and inclusivity. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Hani and Nijet Hassan, um, who are with us this evening, and to thank them once again for their generous contribution to Western, their many contributions, in fact, which extend well beyond mm. the donation that makes this possible. When we approach speakers for this lecture, we share, first of all, our relationship with the Hassan family. Uh, when I first uh, uh, got Timothy on the phone, it took about 30 seconds to find out that that boat had already sailed because the relationship was a long-standing one uh, even before we brought Timothy here today. But we share a relationship with the Hassans with their belief in the po positive value of education as a way to eliminate racism and discrimination, their desire to foster intercultural mm. exchange within this institution, and their goal of stimulating thought and respectful discussion with regard to the histories, societies, and thought of the Islamic and Arab world. And now it's my great pl pleasure to introduce Dr. Timothy Giannotti, this year's distinguished Hassan lecturer. Dr. Giannotti is a scholar of classical Islamic theology, philosophy, and spirituality, with strong interest in Islamic psychology, moral theology, ethics, political thought, comparative religion and spirituality, and interfaith relations. In other words, he's interested in everything. And you need to talk to him for about 30 seconds to figure that out too. He's originally from Portland, Oregon, and has a BA in great books and classics from the University of Notre Dame. And he received his PhD from the University of Toronto in Isl Islamic philosophy and theology with periods of study in the Middle East. He's a scholar of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, one of the most important religious thinkers of the classical period, in addition to a range of scholarly articles, book chapters, and theological essays considering contemporary issues, as well as traditional topics such as the inner or psycho-spiritual processes of moral beautification and character formation within an Islamic framework. He's a Muslim theologian, pastoral leader, and committed interfaith advocate with extensive experience promoting interfaith engagement around the globe, including as the founder and principal teacher of the Islamic Institute for Spiritual Formation in Toronto. He has also had the privilege to have served as one of the two religious advisors for Muhammad Ali when he carefully planned his final statement to the world in the form of his funeral. With more than 20 years of university-level teaching experience in the US and Canada, 
He now holds the position of president and acting provost at the American Islamic College in Chicago. Hmm. Dr. Giannotti's title for today's lecture is Mercy, Compassion, and or Motherly Love. No matter how we translate the term, it all comes down to Rama. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Giannotti. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe you should have waited to clap until after you knew what I was going to share with you today. But be that as it may, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as an unretractable offering for me today. Thank you so much. I want to begin today by a offering a, just a word of thanks um, to Hani and Najat Hassan. You know that uh, this is not the, as, as Jan said, this is not the first time that our paths have crossed, and I hope and pray that it, it won't be the last time. But the, the amount of good that they have done across the Canadian Muslim community, and I'm sure far beyond, um, is, uh, is known to many of us, at least in part. And we're very grateful for your support of education, your support of higher education, and your support of, of um, a medicinal, fostering a medicinal conversation that will help not just break down the biases that we, that we experience and that we hold with regard to Muslims and Islam, but for all of us. And uh, so your contributions are noted and so, so uh, um, deeply appreciated. And I'd like to thank uh, Dean Yan and, and Dr. Jessica, who are here and who've been extremely patient with me as I've been unresponsive to emails and phone calls, and they've been just delightful and welcoming and gracious in, uh, in every exchange. And I, I want to thank all of you, those of you who are here in person, and those of you who are with us online. I look forward to our questions and answers, or our, rather our discussion following my little talk. And, uh, and I, I deeply appreciate the fact that you've taken time out of your lives to, uh, to spend an evening thinking about the Rahmah. Of course, we're having this conversation within a context. And the context right now is not the context that I had anticipated when I said yes to this talk, but this is a context now of grief. It's a context of rage. It's a context of barbarism. It's a, con it's a context of extreme vulnerability, fear, and fragility. And we have to be mindful of the fact that we're not having this conversation in an ivory tower or in a vacuum separate from the suffering that is happening on the ground right now. Just on the train as I came, and this is an absolutely true story, um, the young woman who's a student here at the University of Western Ontario um, was, uh, and took a phone call. And the first thing I overheard her say was, Yes, yes, it's okay, I'm safe, I'm safe. It was her father calling. And of course she was Jewish because her whole family now is fearful that her even returning to school at the University of Western Ontario might place her in danger. And so I didn't want to freak her out that there was a Muslim sitting across from her and that, you know, like, you know, I, I do this for a living. Um, so I, I waited, we, she had a little cat with her, so we talked about the cat, and it kind of I broke, broke the ice a little bit. And then I said, you know, I hope you don't mind me, and I hope I'm not overstepping, but I'm just so sorry to hear that you're not feeling safe, and that you're, you're you know, worried about even coming back to school and attending an event tonight because you're not safe. And I just want you to know, when you close your eyes, that there are bearded brothers out there, people like me, who are in the Muslim community, who will stand for the inviolability of your life and your well-being, and who are concerned for you just as we are for our own. And so she and I ended up talking the whole way here. And, uh, and she is a social justice major. I guess that exists here. And so she's a social justice major. And, so, and she, was, she was absolutely feeling the same way and had lots of compassion for the suffering Palestinians of Gaza 
And I said, but you know, this is a moment when everybody seems to be lined up and I have such a rich circle of contacts that I'm getting emails from all sides. Stand with Israel, stand with Palestine. And, and there's so much lining up on all sides and there are very few voices that are speaking for the protection of innocent people in all communities and on both sides of the conflict. And this is a moment when we are all deeply grieved and we know that things look like they're going to get worse before they get better. And we don't, we don't know what the complete toll of that suffering is, but the, the long arms of that suffering extended even to this lovely young student who is sitting on the train next to me who didn't feel that even coming back to school and attending a function tonight would be safe. And her father was telling her on the phone, maybe not to go because we don't know what, what could happen. And so our, my prayer tonight and my hope for this talk is that whether we attribute this to mystical interconnectivity or to quantum entanglement, my hope and my prayer is that what we discuss tonight may have some positive medicinal influence in some even remote way across the sea and even here because the, the suffering and the fear and the vulnerability and the fragility and the, the grief is not something which is contained by any particular contact, any particular conflict and, and is certainly being felt now. And so my prayers are with the people of Israel and Palestine and my hope and my prayer is that somehow, some way, in the mercy of God, something good and life-giving will come from the ugliness and the barbarism that we're witnessing in social media, in, in the news. A special prayer for Hannah tonight, this young Jewish student who's attending a function tonight and isn't sure that she will be safe in doing so. So this actually, and I was just telling Jan this, that this presentation tonight is, in a way, referring to a project that I will never probably get to until after I stop being president of the American Islamic College or any other place. But it has to do with bringing into being a kind of systematic theology of Rahma in Islam. Now, systematic theology is, is complicated and problematic. It means that there is one idea or concept which is so all-pervasive that it might touch every aspect of a religion's manifestation. And I think that there is a need, obviously, for a coherent, a co coherent systematic approach to religion that is both revelation-based and rational. I mean, God is ineffable. God is, we say in Arabic, Allahu Akbar which is not something we say before we do an unspeakable act of violence. It's simply a statement that God is transcendent and beyond all thought and imagining, all language, all theology, that God is ultimately beyond uh, our understanding and that the deity we worship is ultimately a mystery. So God is ineffable, but I've come to the belief that religion should not be. Religion should not be ineffable. Religion, when it's ineffable, we have a danger of theologies that allow too much contradiction or cognitive dissonance or legal and ethical discourses that, sound, that stand upon a foundation of divine voluntarism. In other words, why is something good? Well, it's good because God commanded it. It may look ugly. It may bring about suffering. It may make me uncomfortable. It may make you uncomfortable. But if God commands it, then it has to be good. This is a question that takes us all the way back to Plato, right? This idea of voluntarism. Is something good because it's good in itself? Or is something good simply because God has commanded it? And I think when we fall too heavily in an uninterrogated way, when we fall too heavily on that side of divine voluntarism, unspeakable things can be done. 
in the name of God. Because they're believed to be legally permissible or legally sanctioned, but unspeakable things can be done. And I think we need to have space in our religion to interrogate that. And so I believe that religion should not be ineffable, even though God will always be beyond our thinking and our imagining. And there is, of course, a widespread confusion about legal permissibility and ethical and moral rectitude. If something is legally permissible, does that mean it's morally correct? That it's the right thing in this circumstance? And this is a question that I, I know that all religions that have a legal dimension have to struggle with. But I think that we need to, again, we need to develop a way, a rational way, a pathway for the interrogation of everything that we talk about in religion, in religious, a religious sphere, because we need to be accountable. But the danger of making theology systematic is that we can distort it. We can oversimplify it. And there have been previous attempts, at least within Islamic history, Islamic intellectual history, and some of the, one of the most famous is the, is the attempt of the Mu'tazilites. The Mu'tazilites were a group in medieval Islam who wanted to create a rational theology that stood upon the principles of unity and justice. Now, it sounds good, sounds kind of issue-free, but what they meant is that if God describes God's self as being just, then God has to do what we understand to be fair. So that is, a virtuous person has to be sent to paradise. An unrepentant sinner has to be sent to the hellfire. So then God is constrained, because that's rational. That's how we understand justice to be. And that their doctrine of divine unity had to do with, I, I think, in some ways, they may have been concerned about the whole Christological problem, had to do with divine speech and whether God's speech, which is what Muslims understand the Quran to be, is actually inseparable from God, which makes it eternal, and yet the Quran is in Arabic, which is a historically, culturally bound language. And so then divine speech then becomes, is divine speech eternal? In which case we have a kind of Christological problem with the Quran? Or is divine speech created, in which case the Quran's relevance may be restricted to a historical and cultural moment? And so, so and of course, they were rationalists, and so what they voted for was the latter. We don't want to get into Christological issues where divine speech is eternal. Therefore, their doctrine of divine unity demanded that certain attributes, like God's speech, were part of the creation, that God created those attributes or those modalities as a way of interacting with the creation, as opposed to being eternally present in the, God, in the Godhead itself. They were also arrogant, as intellectuals are. I'm sure that doesn't happen here at the University of Western Ontario. So they were often arrogant, and well, they wanted everybody to think the way they think and to believe the way they believed. And so they got hooked up with the political powers and tried to make that happen. Well, it didn't really work. And so their intellectualism, their rationalistic theology, ended up being rejected by the majority of people, even to the extent of wanting to preserve God's freedom so dramatically that later theologians said, if God wants to take a virtuous person and throw him into hellfire, God can do that and it will be just. Because God is just. There is no universal principle of justice to which God has to conform. God is just and God is ineffable, therefore justice is ineffable and God can do whatever God wants to do. God is radically free. That also creates some intellectual, rational problems, but those problems seem to be less problematic than the Mu'tazilites and their desire to limit God's freedom and to bind God by certain human notions of fairness and expectation. So the question is, is well, when we talk about a systematic theology, is there anything that we could use or there anything that we could draw upon which would actually touch every aspect of the religion in a way that doesn't distort, in doesn't, um, doesn't twist, or doesn't compromise 
the teachings of the religion. And so the case for Rahmah is a case that we'll be talking about tonight. Rahmah is a word which is often translated as mercy. But as scholars, I know Dr. Ingrid is here, and so say assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ingrid, as she can tell you better than I can, Rahmah comes from a three-letter root in Arabic, because everything pretty much, except for a few words, boils down to three, a three-letter equation in Arabic. Rahmim means the uterus in which our lives began. Raham. And so these names of God in Arabic, Rahman, Rahim, and this idea of Rahmah, is more than just mercy. It, it has woven into its very linguistic fabric notions of maternal love which is nurturing, which is nourishing, which is protective, which is unconditional. And in my humble theologizing and reading of my own scripture and thinking about this, I really have come to believe that Rahmah is the highest form of love in the Quran. Because love, what love when God describes God's self as the Rahman and Rahim, these two variations of this maternal love image, God is communicating to us, to the creation, what God's relationship to us is based on. And indeed, even though the Muslim theologians, after the Mu'tazilite debacle or scandal, they said, God is radically free. But it just so happens that there is one thing in the Quran that God self declares God is bound by. Twice it says that God has enjoined or written rahma ala nafsihi. God has written. This is the same word that the Quran uses when God is saying that fasting is ordained for you. It's decreed upon you. It's required of you. Kutiba alaykum. It's written upon you. And here twice in the same chapter, it says that God has written Rahmah upon God's self. So, if, so it may be possible theologically to say that God is bound by something, but only if God is the one who is doing the binding. And so, twice again, I won't go into those Quranic verses with you, but... I think we have something here that just might help us understand something which is core and touches upon every aspect of the Islamic faith. Rahmah is also, interestingly, the very essence of what Muslims call the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Quran says that the Prophet Muhammad is the uswa hasana, the beautiful role model that we should be following. And many Muslims will grow their beard in a particular way for love of the Prophet, or if they can't grow a beard, then they might clean their teeth in a particular way because they want to emulate the way the Prophet cleaned his teeth with the eucalyptus twig. Or they might dress in a particular way. Sometimes young men who have good legs, not like me, but they have good legs, they'll use a cane because there are, we have reports about the prophet using a cane. But they do all of that in a sense of love, in emulation. They want to be like him. They want to be like him. They want to walk in his footsteps. And so there are many personal, idiosyncratic elements of that question of the son of the prophet's, the prophet's traditional way. It's everything that we remember that he did and said his habitual way. God also has a sunnah. God also has a, a habitual way of, of acting and a habitual way of being. But when we talk about the Prophet's sunnah, the Quran, interestingly, distills all of it in one, in one sentence when the Quran says that we have sent you as nothing but a rahmah to everyone and to everything. مَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And so the entirety of the sunnah is distilled into this concept of rahmah. So now we have God writing rahmah upon God's self, this maternal love, mercy, 
beautiful nature of the relationship between God and humankind and God and the creation. And now we have the prophet himself, the messenger, distilled as a rahmah, as a mercy. And so we remember him as being a mercy to people who didn't like him. We have many stories of him being gracious and hospitable and concerned about people who were, you know, terribly disrespectful and who were maligning him. We have many stories of him being a mercy to the creation, to animals and, uh, and, to, and to people who, who otherwise were on the margins and were not seen as the deserving recipients of mercy in his world. And so he was not just a mercy to his friends or to the people who loved him and followed him and appreciated him. As the Quran says, we've sent you as nothing but a mercy to all the worlds, to everyone and to everything. And so there's something here for us to think about. And then, of course, we have the surah, surah 55, the surah of the Rahman. Rahman being one of the names of God that comes, that's generated from that same root, the, the Rahamim. And the surah of the Rahman, I also sometimes call the, the surah of right relationship. Because in a way, the whole surah is about our relationship. Our relationships with God and our relationships with one another. The relationship with God is all about God's bounteous giving and our appropriate response of gratitude to that giving. But then it also then extends to our relationships with each other as we read about something that the Quran will call the mizan, the balance, right? Balance in the creation. And so in that surah, it opens up and we learn that it is from Rahma, from the Rahman, Alam al Quran, that the revelation of the Quran that is coming out of the Rahman, that's coming from Rahma. And then we read the Khalaq al Insan, that the human being, not the man, but the human being is created out of Rahma, from Rahma. And then we, wa Alamahu al Bayan, and then we read that the, the, teaching of that which makes everything clear. And there, are, again, Dr. Ingrid can tell us all the different ways in which the word bayan is translated and commented upon. But the idea is that, that you know, maybe simply it could be reason. The idea that the, the thing within us or the thing in our life that makes everything clear, right, is also the result of God's rahma. And then, of course, we have the idea that, and it is from rahma that God has established the balance, the mizan. And so then the rahmah then becomes the foundation for justice. It becomes the foundation for human right relationships. Very often before, you know, I started negotiating real estate deals and, um, and, and doing academic discipline and all these other fun things that fill my days, right? I used to, you know, do a lot of marriages and burials and more pastoral things, and uh, which is really, um, you know, one of the great loves and passions of my life. And often in weddings, I would recite these verses and say that because God has written mercy upon God's self, then you as entering into this committed relationship must write now mercy upon your own hearts because mercy has to be the foundation that rahmah has to become the foundation of the way you aspire to love each other in that selfless, nurturing, protective, benevolent spirit. And then Rahma then is the reason why we as human beings have been showered with all of these incredible blessings, which we should not deny and must not deny. And so after 9-11, as I've been thinking about Rahma over the years, after 9-11, I kind of came up with a litmus test. And it might be oversimplified and problematic, but I often told people that it doesn't really matter how much Arabic 
somebody comes to you, how many hadiths they have memorized, how many Quranic verses they have memorized. If you don't detect any rahmah in their message or their tone, then it cannot be your religion. Cannot be. Because God has written rahmah upon God's self. And there's nothing in this religion that can happen in this religion outside of the canopy of rahmah. And so I think that maybe we can make a case for developing a systematic theology in Islam based upon the concept of rahmah. Because there is nothing in the religion that can be properly understood outside of the canopy of rahmah. And so the implications of this for us, we can think about even some of the ethical implications of this, is that in order to become a true disciple of the Prophet Muhammad, before we trim our beard in a particular way or make ourselves a poster boy or poster girl for this religion, we must aspire to become a mercy or an embodiment of that maternal love to everybody, to everything. And that makes the sunnah pretty hard, right? Growing my beard is pretty easy because it just grows by itself, right? And dressing up in a particular way is pretty easy because that's just, that's easy to do. But the idea of be becoming a rahmah to everyone and to everything is a lofty and and ultimately, of course, unattainable aspiration. And yet that is what God is calling us to be. Theologically, then, I think we might venture to say that there can be no Islam without Rahmah. And that if this religion is not about Rahmah, it's not about anything. Of course, this is problematic, and we'll, we'll certainly get some pushback. Because the foundational concept in our religion is tawheed, the affirmation, the active affirmation of divine unity. But one of the problems with tawheed is that we forget that it's a verbal noun. And for those of you who have studied Arabic, you know that this comes from the, from the root, you know, fa'ala yufa'ilu taf'il. So it's, it's the idea is the act of making unity. And so to actually become an upholder of Tawheed, we have to be unitive in the way we live. We have to be bringing people together. And this is one of the things about, you know, the, the great privilege of serving Muhammad Ali for 10 years. May God be merciful to him. Was that he, in, by his just... By his simple, he was not an educated man. He was not a scholar of Arabic or Islamic studies. He, but there was something about his character that brought people together. And he treated everybody like they were important. And almost everybody I've met in those years and since has a Muhammad Ali story. Oh, I was waiting tables one day when he came into the restaurant. And the way he treated me changed my life forever. Or, oh, he came to visit my, my locker room one time when I lost a boxing match. And he came to my, my locker room to tell me what a great job I did and what I need to work on. Right? Or, you know, it's like all these stories. And when he died and we washed his body, there was a brother from every corner of the planet. And by some undeserved act of divine mercy, I was one of those four. But it was almost as if we were representing the four corners of the earth preparing him for his burial. And in his funeral, Right? We saw the indigenous chiefs. We saw he wanted to make sure that there were women on the stage. He wanted to make sure that his Jewish friends were included. He wanted to make sure that everybody was there and that he wanted this to be his final statement to the people of planet Earth and that love, that love is a unitive power. And so sure, Tawhid is central to the faith. But aside from affirming divine unity and understanding that religion, like love, if it's, if it's real, is unitive, there can be no Islam without Rahmah. 
And then finally, the socio-political implications of this. And I, maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll end here as we think through this together. In the Quran, in the Surah of Women, it says that God created us, all of us, from a single soul. Right? And this idea of creating us from a single soul, understood within the canopy of Rahmah, means that all of us, regardless of our religious self-identification or lack thereof, regardless of any other differentiating detail with regard to our human identity, that all of us are one family, that we are connected. And it's from that one soul, from her, that God created her mate. And from the two of them then issued forth many women and men. And the idea is that we are connected because God is the Rahman, God created the human family in the Rahmah. And so as we see everyone taking sides right now, and we see everyone tribaling up and pointing out the barbarism of the other without the courage to embrace or to face the barbarism within their own tribe, I think Rahmah allows us, or it opens up another way. Another way for us to escape the tribalism of our human nature, and I use that human nature now with a lowercase h and a lowercase n, not the capital h of, and the capital N of the human nature to which we believe, at least as Muslims, God is call, constantly calling us. But it opens up a way for us to then think about the sanctity of all life, the sanctity of every child. The appropriate way to manage conflict, understanding that conflict is an unavoidable reality in human life. But I was telling my son a lesson that our dear friend and teacher, Mahmoud Ayyub, the blind Quranic scholar who passed away a few years back, may God's mercy be upon him, he told me, he said, Timothy, God doesn't talk about violence in the Quran because violence is inherently good or because God wants to promote violence. God talks about violence in the Quran because violence is part of the human experience and God wants to restrain it. God wants to restrain it and to limit its destructive potential. And that's why we have rules, Timothy. When they stop fighting, you stop fighting. We have rules that you can't violate a non-combatant. We have rules that you can't cut a tree down or salt a field or harm an animal. Because God enters into the discussion of violence where that happens. God enters into that discussion in order to restrain us and to bring us back to a place of not fighting, a place of not violence, a place of managing our affairs in a more humane and more peaceful way. And if indeed we're going to take this idea seriously that we can craft a systematic theology of Rahmah, of mercy, of maternal love, then it means that Rahmah also has to guide us and inform us about how to manage these terrible, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, anger-inciting moments of violence that we seem to be perpetually getting in and out of. And so I think that there's something maybe relevant to the moment, something providentially relevant to the moment about the topic that I had on my heart, the topic I wanted to speak to, and these terrible events that are unfolding right now in Israel and in Gaza and across the world with all of the shaken and fear, fearful, vulnerable people 
who are now affected by it. I think that Rahmah shows us a way out and another way of being. And so with that said, I will leave this thought with you, and if any of you beat me to crafting that systematic theology of Rahmah in Islam, I'll be delighted to congratulate you. But, uh, but this is a topic and a, and a project that I, I don't see myself getting to tonight or tomorrow, but I look forward to that moment, and I also look forward to the discussion that will ensue tonight, inshallah. So may God bless you, and, and thank you for being here, and thanks to the University of Western Ontario and the Hassan family, and, um, and, uh, and ultimately thanks to the one whose merciful decree, loving decree, called us together for this moment. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Here, do you want to use mine? Uh, okay, you got it? Okay. Dr. Um, Giannopoulos has, as you can see, very generously offered to uh, take questions. And so I'll open the floor. Um, so if you have a question, allow me to come by or somebody to come by with this microphone because it will allow the people who are on Zoom to hear you as well. So I'll let you in a second. Thank you. I was really intrigued to hear your discussion of uh, contradictions mm. within the human being, and I would argue within the religion, yes. whether it's uh, uh, Islam, Christianity, whatever, mm -hmm. and and the and in our brain as well, we have a logical part and a very emotional part, and how do you so? Are our religions accepting the fact that this is what we have and we have to work with it? Is this it? And how does that relate to what's going on now? Mm. When we talk about religion, of course, we're, we're within the realm of human language and human systems, right? Even when we believe that these religions have divine origin, right? And so, uh, within the Abrahamic family, of course, we are religions that have foundational texts of revelation, right? And there's no, uh, I don't think there's any theologian that I'm aware of, at least none that want to uh, be publicly recognized, who would advocate going back and changing a text, right? So, but, but the, the only text that you and I will ever know is the one that we're reading and the one that we're interpreting. And I think we have to be epistemologically humble about the fact that I'm reading this text as a 21st century male who grew up in Portland, Oregon with all of my problems and all of my interpretive idiosyncrasies. And so I, I think that we, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to always extract meaning, life-giving meaning from these texts and, and, apply it, and apply it to our lives. Now sometimes, sometimes we come to the texts with other agendas, right? Power, domination. So it might be that I'm reading a text in order to find verses that will help me claim power or domination over another person. And so we can never escape ourselves and our own vices. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to read these texts in community so that we can check each other and interrogate each other. I love this this rabbinical practice of the Hebruta study partnerships, where these rabbis for decades and decades will get up every morning and read Torah with their partner, their study partner, and their job is to argue over Torah, right? They call these the wars of Torah. Arguing with each other in a way, understanding that you're reading, I'm reading, I'm interrogating you, I'm interrogating myself, we're interrogating the text, but, we're the, but the goal, is to emerge from that loving argument, right, with an enhanced and expanded understanding of the possibilities of scripture and the possibilities of interpretation. And I think that, but that said, right, we, we, uh, we are always going to be um, 
uh, we're always going to have the liability of our own partiality when it comes to reading texts. And that's why I think having some overarching principles like justice, right? And the Quran, as the Quran says, that you must uphold justice even when you yourselves are implicated, right? Which is something that nobody really ever has the courage to do, or very few people would or, or can. But the idea is that we have to have some of these inviolable principles, one of which I believe is rahmah, which, which must check our readings. And must we, so we have to have something that can, that can hold our range of interpretation in, in check. And I think that, but, but the fact is, is that we, um, you know, that the business of religion is always going to, is always going to have its, its beautiful and liberating dimensions, but the liabilities of religion are always going to be, are always going to be coming from us. And so I think we just have to be really mindful of those liabilities. And we also have to be mindful of our desire as historically and cultural bound minds, we must always be mindful and cautious of our desire to try to declare that our reading of the text is universal and outside of time and outside of cultural context. And so I think that this is something that this is, um, it may be that, uh, that there can be no eternal or universal reading of a text in the absence of, of the prophetic founder of that text, right? Because in, uh, the rest of us are so constrained by history and by gender and by all these other historical factors that it's, it would be impossible for us to assert otherwise. I don't know if I've answered your question, but... Uh, really well. Now I've got a dozen more, but there are other Okay, thank you. Uh, first, thank you so much for for your thoughts. And, no, thank uh, you. I, I resonate with them a lot. And um, I think your last point about uh, historical context and, and kind of also just researching, I've done a little bit of research on the history of Islam mm. and the uh, different different thoughts that entered and the responses. Um, my, my thought is, is the word... Uh, Muslim, one of those categorizations. I've had this thought that maybe that the word Muslim is not necessarily something the Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted us to like take, whereas the, the word for a believer in the Quran might be mu'min, it might be muhsin, it might be a believer, it might be someone who's doing good. And so these, these uh, categorizations that you mentioned uh, are, are interesting to think about. Um, and developing, let's say, a universal approach on, on Rahmah mm. as, a, as a foundational piece of our faith. How do we, um, how do we avoid narrowing something that might, might be very vast? Mm. Or your thoughts maybe on that? Yeah. I think that last part of the question is, 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 is tough, right? How do we avoid our tendency to narrow, to tribalize, to, to restrict. Um, and, and of course, we, you know, we have, you know, Muslim is, is, a, is a word which is enshrined within the revelation itself, right? So, so it's not something that we can like e easily dispense. Um, you know, some, some people have translated Muslim, again, this is again a verbal concept, an active participle. So this is from the, another form of the Arabic verb, but it literally one who's in the act of, sometimes people say surrendering. I know our, our, our colleague Navid Reza says, it's the act of making peace or making wholeness. Um, there are different ways in which people read that. And of course, there's a sense in which all the prophets and all of their families and their righteous companions were Muslimun, right? We're, we're in a state of Islam. So there's a sense of universal Muslims and then there's also a, a more restricted sense of people who follow the, you know, the way of the Prophet Muhammad and, and accept the alayhi salatu wasalam and accept the Quran as their, as their, uh, their sacred text. So there, there are different levels and different ways in which we, we understand these, 
these um, these verses and these and these texts, and I I I I think if if we're going to err, let's say, and we will err, we are going to make mistakes. I would prefer to err on the side of being overly open and let God be the one who restricts, as opposed to erring on the side of restricting and and then wake up when I die to realize that God, uh, that God is all embracing and inclusive in the way, you know, so, and, 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 you know, I, I've, um, so, so I, I think that at the end of the day, I, I think that we all have to be cautious and wary of our own desires, maybe our own limited desires to, to narrow, to restrict and to tribalize. And I, I think that, Moments like the current one are, that becomes our temptation, but it seems to me that the calling, the, you know, the, the moral and ethical call of this moment is not to do that, but to, um, but to, uh, to uphold the sense of that balance, right? And, and to me that those, um, all of those, the, the taking of innocent life, especially the premeditated and purposeful uh, intentional taking of innocent life is uh, is a violation on all fronts, and uh, and has no justification. Um, my uh, my question deals with the way you brought love into rahmat. So for me, in my bias, uh, it's love that delivers the rahma. It's God's love that delivers the mercy. Mm. So I see in your, in your talk a beautiful image, but I wonder, where is the love? Is it antecedent of the rahma? Or is the rahmat delivering the love? It's a, it's a Mu'tazilite question you're asking. So, so the, I'll just repeat the question. Right. So, is love the antecedent of rahma? Right. And if so, where is the love? Or is or is rahma itself the love? And so, in a way, you're asking a Mu'tazilite question: whether rahma is one of the eternal attributes of God, or whether it was created along with the creation. Um, as a modality through which God then would interact with us and, and the creation. Um, and and in, say, in, in we're Arabic, above my pay grade here. In so, the Arabic, does the love, yeah. does, does, in the Arabic, does the love have a root? Like Rahman? Well, we have hub, right? Hub, hub, hub. Yeah, we have hub. Um, but I, I mean, the, and again, I mean, this is, um, this is one of the reasons why I'm throwing it out because I want us to talk about it, I want us to think about it. To me, I, I really, uh, I don't know. To me, rahma in English, right, the, the word I keep coming back to for rahma is not mercy or compassion, it's love. And it's, I see that. It, and it's, it's even love that has a kind of maternal I see nature. That. I see and that. so, so to me, this is a much more graphic and evocative word for love than hub. Yes. You know? I agree. Because it's, it's so, and, and again, I, I will, you know, uh, I, I am barred from the experience of motherhood, so I'm a spectator in that regard. Uh, and so I can't say what it feels like, right, to have a child within my body and to feel a love before I've even met the person I'm loving, right? And to feel that so viscerally right. and so protectively. I, I, I can only imagine, right? But the Quranic language to me is, and even this is this is echoed even the even in the 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 um, verified prophetic reports about his statements that the Prophet himself, والسلام, connected the the names of God, the Rahman, the Rahim, with the root of Raham, right? Right. Saying that anyone who disrespects the wombs is, you know, is committing an offense to the Rahman. The idea that, so this was even prophetically connect, connected, and so, I, 
So where does hub belong mm, in the Quran? I don't know. This question, is a question for our question. Quran scholar. That's you, isn't it? No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just an Islamic philosophy and theology guy. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, we, but we have a Quranic scholar who might where, enter where, the discussion, where, where Dr. Ingrid, who might be able to tell us where, where is hub in all this. But, but I, I, I would almost, I mean, my, my, my sense here and, and my, my um, not completely tested uh, hypothesis here is that there is nothing which more graphically communicates divine love in the Quran than Rahmah. That's your, that's your... And, and, and that's the best I can give you now, but, but that's just, I mean, remember, that's just coming from an Islamic philosophy and theology guy. Yeah. Yes, oh, again, yeah, good, please. Thank you. Uh, I think the old saying was, uh, did man create God? or did God create man? And I would argue Darwin came along and said, well, actually there's another explanation for this, mm. you know, and love comes from a man for a woman, so they form a partnership, and then they raise children, which they love, and uh, it just goes on from there. So it's sort of an evolutionary trait that yeah. has evolved over the eons. But, well, you know, an I, alternative I, thought. I, I have to say, I didn't expect to be discussing Darwin tonight, but um, <laughs> but but uh, but I um, okay. I'm just going to hold that for now. We can. Uh, I think Dr. Ingrid had her hand up. Yeah, and and Abuna O'Connor also, please afterwards. Yeah, and this this is not amplifying our voice. It's just for the online people. So I'm going to. Yeah, so just pretend I'm, I'm your child. Speak, I'm going to speak louder so other people can hear me. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Timothy. It was really a beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, my question is, I was really struck when you said that after 9-11, especially after thinking a lot about it, that uh, you decided that, you know, no matter what, to paraphrase you, what you know, Quranic verses or hadith or rules that someone might have, that if there was no rahma in what they were presenting, then it couldn't be from our religion. Mm. And, and I think that is so important and so powerful because it brings, it brings, um, it's about the person, faith is in the end individual. Mm. We're responsible for our own relationship with God. No one else can answer for that. And there are many ordinary believers who, um, who have this huge, not just cognitive dissonance, but heart dissonance between what they're told is the religion and what they deeply, deeply feel is, is truly their religion. But they don't have the fancy language. They can't quote the scripture. They can't come up with the, you know, Hadith, the report, prophetic reports, but to say to say this, you know, to make this uh, a litmus test, a criteria, the center of everything, really seems to me very, very powerful, and it's the opposite of what most theologians have done historically, which is to create creeds, and creeds are all about fear, about you know, people are afraid that the ordinary people will transgress the limits and say something about God that is not appropriate or seemly or that violates the Tawheed. And so they're trying to put as many guardrails around and it's all about, about fear. Whereas what you've done is really shift, uh, shift it back to the believer. Why haven't we done more of that? Or has there been more of that done and where is it? has it been done historically, hmm. not just in sort of pastoral care or something like that? Right. You know, uh, uh, it's a great question. So the question is really, um, has this kind of um, alternative way of framing the religious life and, and defining what it means to be a spiritual and religious being. 
where in the tradition do we find that? And, 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 and I think, I think it, it is in the tradition. Um, and I think we, and, and I think you, you would be as prepared to identify places or maybe even more so in the tradition that, that speak to this. I, I think sometimes it has been relegated to discourses which themselves get marginalized, like Sufi discourse or this discourse. And so then that's not orthodox. That's not, but you're right that too much of our religious discourse, even now, is fear-based. And my understanding about mono, the call of monotheism in pre-Islamic Arabia, and again, I'm venturing into your, your terrain here, but my understanding is that if you live in a world where you're afraid of offending this goddess or that spirit or this spirit, that the call of monotheism is a call out of fear and into a place of one-stop shopping, like into a place of, you know, like comfort. And this is why when the Quran talks about people who believe that La khawfun alayhim. This is often we translate this in the future tense that, that no fear will be upon them, but this is present tense Arabic. That fear does not hover over those people who believe and live righteously, that they are fearless because they've been called out of fear into a place of security. Right? And, and what gives me the hope to wake up in the morning is that the one I worship has written Rahma ala nafsihi, the one I worship. And, and so no matter what I've done or what I've failed to do, I trust in that mercy, that love, that compassion, that connection, right? That, that sense. And so, and so I think that what needs to happen in some ways, and I think that a lot of my own preaching and public teaching has been sort of taking teachings from those marginalized discourses like Sufism and mainstreaming them and saying, look, this is not a Sufi teaching. This is a Quranic teaching. This is an Islamic teaching, and this is this is um, this is yours to discover. And I, I think that this is why, when I first moved back to Toronto and Ontario all those years ago, uh, I loved the fact that on the license plate it said, "You know, Ontario, yours to discover." And I said, "That's how we should be teaching Islam, right? We should be we should be like taking off all these all these offenses and saying, go discover it.'" Right? Because it's in that sort of free and unfettered discovery that I became a Muslim. Right? It was in that free and unfettered discovery that, that I've come to these, what, what I believe to be um, really healthy minded, loving, luminous teachings that have improved my life and improved me in so many ways. But I, I think that, um, that what we need to do is we need to, we need to excavate some of this stuff from those marginalized discourses. And, and think seriously about how we can reframe them as just mainstream Muslim teachings. And, and I think that we, we have to unlearn that fear. Even the teaching of prayer as an obligation to me is very problematic because, again, it comes back to that fear thing. And I, I've, I've often thought that, that prayer is not an obligation so much as it is an opportunity for us to reconnect, to... You know, and, and I think anyone who in, engages in a practice of meditation or prayer knows that they're a much better person when they're doing it than they are when they're not doing it. And so, and so to me, the, the idea of, of prayer as, a, as an opportunity is a much more exciting way of framing than prayer as an obligation. You know, and so I think that we need to rethink the way we, we, we look at these things and the way we frame these things because I, I think that um, you know, uh, one, of, one of our greatest problems, again, just coming back to the earlier comment, one of our greatest problems is that we've, we've imposed too much of our own insecurities upon the theology. And this is why I, I keep saying that, you know, God is ineffable, but religion should not be, right? Religion should be, should be something that we can interrogate and we can, we can um, identify where we've, where we've caught ourselves, when we've created obstacles for ourselves and for others. And the whole mystery of being created in God's image, I'm afraid we've messed up so terribly because what we've done is we've taken that as a license to recreate God in our image, and that's a mess. That's a total mess. Then all of a sudden God becomes male, and God becomes angry, and God becomes all these things that, that Rahma doesn't, uh, doesn't work with. I'm sorry, Abuna O'Connor had his hand up too. Can we, Father O'Connor? Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, there were a lot of echoes in, uh, in my mind and heart from my Christian Roman Catholic mm. theology. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, congruence in happening. Um, my question is moving where you kind of touched near the end in the ethical, social, political order. Um, one of the great struggles that I have in the present moment is how can I be a pacifist, nonviolent, in the face of such uh, atrocious violence? And uh, the I would presume that this would is there kind of a nonviolent. Uh, tradition that would flow out of Brahma uh, as there would out of hopefully authentic Christian Catholic theology of love and mm. mercy, compassion, forgiveness. Uh, so my, my question is, is uh, how would you see uh, an, uh, pacifism if that's a reality uh, that that flows out of this uh, wonderful concept that you've been presenting to them. It's not just a concept, it's a reality. Right, okay. thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's more than a concept, it's a reality. So just for me to rephrase that question and tell me if I'm doing it, doing it wrong, that, that are there traditions, Islamic traditions of pacifism, which flow out of this idea of rahmah, um, and, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, is there anything more to it? Or you give a, a greater context to it, but help me. Yeah, yeah. How, do you, how, how do you internalize that and so, realize it, you know? So the, the answer is yes, right? We do have Muslim, Muslim um, philosophies and theologies of, uh, of radical pacifism and nonviolence, and we know that, uh, that, um, that, um, that some of these some of these were walking alongside Gandhiji when he was working for Indian independence from the British. Um, and so we do have traditions that, that, that exist. And, um, and, and uh, maybe Dr. Ingrid can help me remember that the lovely Syrian scholar who passed away, Afra Jalabi's uh, uncle, um, do you remember his name? A Syrian scholar of... And if I remember it, I'll, 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 I'll remember, because I remember he even came to the North Center once and gave a talk, but I'm trying to remember his, um, you know, before he passed away, may God be merciful to him. So there are currents there, um, but Islam is not, I mean, scripturally, and again, Dr. Ingrid can tell us better than I can, but Islam is not a, strictly speaking, a, a pacifistic religion. So there is a place for the use of force especially in extreme situations when, um, you know, when people are suffering under oppression and, and, other, and, and other extreme forms of deprivation and, and injustice. Um, and, and, uh, and as the Quran says, how could, you, how could you not come to their aid when they're crying out? You know, when will the, the victory or the help of God come to us? And so, so um, but even within that, Right? We do have some currents of nonviolence and non pacifism within Islam. And I, I think that, that, um, that what's, what I would like to say, as I, and I think that being the father of, of you know, children and, and being, um, you know, I think that there are situations I, I could not declare myself to be a pacifist because I can imagine scenarios where I would intervene, right? I would forcefully intervene but I would like to think that there must be a way for us to separate between force and the use of force and violence, right? Violence to me is the, is the, is the, the aberration of force. And I know that from, you know, um, I've, I've never been a, a, a big martial artist, but I read a lot about it and I've studied it with lots of stops and starts over the years. But I can remember so many of my martial arts teachers telling me that the goal of martial arts is not to fight but it's to prevent, is to prevent situations from getting to a place 
where violence is done. And it's more about, you know, self-cultivation and those things. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a powerful question, and it's a question I think that, um, that, that certainly Muslims think about and talk about. And it's something that we need to interrogate. But I, I, I've long thought that there must be, there must be a line between the permissible and responsible and restrained use of force on the one hand and violence on the other. Because violence is a whole other concept, right? Is the, the actual going against nature, the actual betrayal of nature in a way and violation of nature. And so I think, I mean, I, this is something that I'm going to walk away thinking about now tonight. So I uh, thank you. And, uh, and thank you for being here, Abuna. Yeah. Yes, Jawad Saeed, that's right. Jauda, right? Jauda Saeed, that's right. May God be merciful to him. Uh, those who are here, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.